Alright, hello everybody, and welcome to another episode of Hey Go Have a Good One. Uh, yeah, that's not really... That's not really eccentric or energetic enough. Hold up a second, let me let me try this again. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Hey Go Have a Good One. Ha! I'm your host, Sam. Ha! Ha! Oh, dear. Yeah, I feel bad if anybody out there actually has to use that kind of voice in their life. But, anyway, what we're looking at today is Panic at the Disco's fourth studio album, which is also the one that has the longest title out of all of them, Too Weird to Live, Too Rare to Die. Now, this album was released on the 8th of October, 2013. Um, it was recorded as a trio. Uh, the album was produced by Butch Walker and is the only album to feature bassist Dallin Weeks since he officially joined the band in 2010. This is also the final album to feature the drummer Spencer Smith. So, Spencer, after this album was made, he left the band due to his battles with alcohol and prescription drug pills, making this technically the final album by Panic! at the Disco as a rock band. The next albums basically became solo projects for Brendan, the only original member still in the band. Now, this album was released with generally positive reviews. Um, the lowest score that I'm looking here is, uh, a, uh, two stars. Another one that has, like, a four out of ten. But, there's also a decent amount of four stars. You got ratings of, like, eight out of ten, four out of five, um, an A minus, which is good. I don't know how you actually would handle those types of scores. But, yeah. Uh, it peaked. It reached the number one. It was number one in the uh, US top alternative albums, top rock albums, and the US Billboard vinyl albums. It sold. It ended up making gold in Canada and the United Kingdom, and platinum in the United States. So, went pretty well, I would say. Went pretty darn well. Yeah. Yeah! Hmm. Apparently, it had... It debuted at number two on the US Billboard 200, earning the band their second career number two. Hey! So, anyway, I reckon that's enough pretense. I will also go ahead and say that this album is said to be a concept album of sorts. It's kind of a uh, coming of age type of story within Las Vegas, which is where Brendan and Spencer and all the original members of the band grew up, actually. Also, the original album had only 10 songs, each one between three and three and a half minutes each. Which I think, uh, from memory, makes it the shortest album in the entire... Shortest album that, um, Panic has made. I might need... I'll check that by the next album that I look at. See which one's the longest and which one's the shortest, but like... Yeah, all of the songs in this album are very, like, particular. Like, they're all very, I suppose, consistent as far as time goes. Um, like I said, there's only, like, a 30-second difference between the shortest song in the album and the longest song. The shortest song, I think think is nicotine and the longest i believe is the end of all things and yeah there's only a 30 second difference between them but the album got some bonus tracks much like vices and virtues 
it got some bonus tracks in the Japanese and Target releases of the album, which is kind of a weird combination now that I think about it. I wonder how popular Panic at the Disco is in Japan, because Japan seems to get a lot of special features in their albums. And Target? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one too. Only this time, uh, there's only two uh, bonus songs. So it's not as complicated as Vices and Virtues was, where there was like six different bonus features and you got them all in different ways. Uh, also, much like Vices and Virtues, I will be comparing each final song as ending songs of the whole album, and talk about which song I reckon is the better ending song. So, we're gonna go through all of the songs and I'm gonna give them a score out of 10. For those of you who are not aware of how I score this stuff, um, anything that is above a 6 out of 10 means that I like the song, and I can see myself going out of my way to listen to it again. So I might look it up on YouTube, or Spotify, or somewhere else. Uh, a score between 4 and 6, so basically 4, 5, or 6, means that I feel the song is kind of meh. I can't really see myself going out of my way to listen to it, but if it were to just show up, if it were to just pop up on the radio or Spotify or something like, or at a party or something like that, I wouldn't want to skip it. I would still, I would still like it enough to listen to it. I'm just not going to go out of my way to listen to it. And then anything below a four basically means that I don't like the song and if it were to just show up out of nowhere, I would generally prefer to just skip it rather than listen to it. So, we are going to start off with the opening song in the album called This Is Gospel. Now, this song is a very popular song. I'd say it's one of the most popular Panic songs uh, ever made. Possibly second only to I Write Sins Not Tragedies. It's very popular. It's also one of the first Panic songs I ever listened to. Um, I'd heard it before I even knew that it was a Panic song. Obviously as a meme. If you've been around the internet, you know that this song is featured as a meme. Particularly that chorus. But yeah. Several people have actually stated this song to be the best Panic at the Disco song ever made. Or at least top 10. It's like, it's basically always in the top 10 somewhere. Anyway, so, the song starts off with a heartbeat. We have a heartbeat that's setting the tone. A uh, very rhythmic uh, heartbeat that... I'm imagining if that was a real heartbeat rhythm, doctors would be rather concerned about it. But it's to set the mood. It's not to show how healthy the heartbeat is. Um, when it, they when Brendan starts singing, because obviously he's singing again, the singing sounds very digital or like robotic, which. I'm imagining means that he was using, like, a lot of different effects on his voice. Um, then you have a drum beat that comes in during, like, maybe halfway through the first verse. Then you get piano and then more vocals to fill in the overall sound. There's some very weird, vague lyrics. Um, like... Uh, like, the first lyrics of the song are, This is gospel for the fallen ones, locked away in permanent slumber, assembling their philosophies and pieces of broken memories. Yeah, very vague lyrics. They're very weird. I've actually had people... I know a couple of people who have said that this is kind of like a nothing song. That isn't really doing anything. The lyrics are just there to, uh, sound weird. However, then we get into the chorus. 
This is a very explosive chorus, instrumentally and vocally. I am a big fan of this chorus. And also the backing vocals afterwards are a really nice sound with the guitar and drums. The bit that comes after the fear of falling apart. Those like, those vocals that are like, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, no, um, anyway. The second verse is more filled in now. There's more instruments that are playing at once, so it's a much more full sound. And the vocals also sound more forceful, maybe because of the, uh, um, maybe because of the lyrics. Uh, then you get the raptor sound. Eh? Raptor sound? I guess there's a, a, a raptor sound in the song somewhere, but during the second verse, I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember that. I just have in my notes just raptor sound with a question mark. I guess that was just something that I noticed when I listened to it. I don't know, something like that. Anyway. The pre-chorus in the second verse sounds quieter now. Uh, it brings back a a big chorus, and the second chorus basically just repeats itself, which uh, which is fine. Uh, then you have uh, the lyric, um, the fear of falling apart. I wonder if that's the most important lyric here, because after. After the second chorus, because there is only two choruses in this song, uh, he just repeats that lyric, the fear of falling apart, over and over again. So I'm wondering if that's the most important lyric. Uh, the heartbeat, that heartbeat, which I'm imagining has been playing through that entire song, it also ends the song, gradually slowing down until it stops entirely. Uh, the music video of this song also has a heart monitor sound, but it leads to uh, flatlining. Uh, the music video is a person on a hospital bed, and it's like a bunch of doctors are trying to like hold him down, but he's like fighting back, and it's like his soul is kind of leaving him. And by the end of it, his soul is like running away, and then you got that like. And then, like, it flatlines at that point. Which is a pretty cool effect. It's only in the music video, though. This song is also actually part of an ongoing story, kind of a musical universe going on here, with other songs in later albums, which we'll get to when we get to them. But... Yeah, that's why I brought up the music video, because that's actually the first part of a story that's been told across the rest of these albums. Anyway, so, this song, This Is Gospel, is about Spencer Smith's battle with addiction and alcoholism. It's basically become an anthem for those going through tough times, the chorus flipping between two perspectives. Spencer's struggle was physically killing him, and figuratively killing Brendan. It brings up the lyrics, If you love me, let me go, referencing the band and how Spencer's addiction had been tearing the band apart, but he stayed because of his fear of falling apart. He was concerned, he was afraid that the band would basically die if he left. It would just, like... Brendan might not want to continue, or they won't have the same sound, so they won't be as successful with just Brendan. So yeah. He had a fear of falling apart. And so this song was basically written for Spencer. So, overall, I give this song an 8.5 out of 10. It has an explosive chorus that manages to sustain itself for quite a bit, it's got some very creative choices within the song being made that pay off nicely to the theme of the song, as well as being extremely memorable as a meme. It's got that meme, it's got that meme rep 
And it also, yeah, creative choices that paid off, stuff like the heartbeat, stuff like, like, it's not super well, like, it's not super, I guess, niche, but uh, going, like, a cappella uh, during the pre-chorus. I know other songs that have done this, but that's always nice when that happens. Also, I'm not usually a fan of, like, digital effects being put onto a voice, but it does sound nice here. So I reckon 8.5 is a fair score for This Is Gospel. Next up, we have Miss Jackson. We have a very interesting, quiet intro, along with some drums. Um, the opening lyrics of Miss Jackson sound... It kind of sounds like an old-timey radio, but, like, the person who's singing at this point, who actually wasn't Brendan at this point, it was, uh, another, uh, it was another artist that actually had worked alongside Brendan during this one. Lolo, that's, that's their name. I've never heard of Lolo before. Who is Lolo? If the internet could help out with this. Yeah, so she's seen in the intro. And it's like, it sounds like an old, she's singing through an old timey radio, but she's also like very far away from the microphone as well, which is like, hmm, interesting. But yeah, my internet uh, has decided to go well. Uh, I decided I wanted to find out who Lolo is and the internet won't let me. So I'm imagining this person is uh I believe it's a she. I believe she has a very dark past if the internet doesn't want me to find out more about her. So, oh dear, that sounds, she sounds like a very dangerous human being with a scary reputation. I'm sure that she has destroyed planets in her wake. So she's an American, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Well, looking... Looking at her most popular songs, Miss Jackson is apparently her most popular. It's also the only one that I actually recognize. I might have heard some of the others, but like, I don't, I don't know. Oh, she was also in Centuries by Fall Out Boy. Oh, maybe I should do Fall Out Boy. I actually haven't heard that much of Fall Out Boy. That might be something to do after I'm done with Panic. Anyway, so, in the intro, we get the intro, we get some drums, and then we get some feedback, like the sound of feedback coming in, and then you get a really explosive intro, like, it's the kind of thing that you really headbane to, and it also headbanes so hard that I opened up a tab. Yeah, so, then, the first verse after that excellent intro, it pulls back a heap, like, potentially too much. It might pull back too much, actually. Uh, Brendan is adding an interesting effect on his voice to make it sound more static. And then we also get uh, some clapping in the pre-chorus, which also sounds nice. The, uh, the chorus, the chorus is a real letdown, to be, like, I'm gonna be honest, the chorus is... Quite the letdown. We get, like, an excellent intro. We get an awesome intro. And then the chorus is, like... It sounds nothing like the intro sound. Um... We get some nice uh, backing vocals. Like that whole... Hey! Bit. I sound awful. Um... Very high. Very nice. I like the backing vocals. The drum beat is also, like, pretty strong throughout throughout. Oh! And actually, I just remembered, there's a bit during the second chorus where the backing vocals go, like, super high as well, and it's like, ah! something like that, I don't know. Um, that sounds cool. I like that. I, I, I still come back to the chorus might actually be my least favorite part of the song. It's a pretty big letdown, but, like, 
I don't know, maybe the intro is, like, exactly the same as the chorus, but, like, there's, like, more of a difference. Maybe it's the lyrics? I don't think the lyrics really gel as well. When it's, like, when it's just saying Miss Jackson all the time. Uh, rather than just, like, the, the chanting that was going on in the intro. The bridge is much like that quiet part of the intro, but with backing vocals. I think the, uh, I think the backing vocals are actually the best part of the lyrics. Yeah. Uh, there's no outro either. Kind of like the last song, it just kind of ends as soon as the final chorus is done. But, uh, wait, no, I'm saying that this song does not have an outro like the last song did. This Is Gospel had an outro to it. Miss Jackson doesn't. It kind of just ends once the final chorus is done. So anyway, uh, this song is basically about a promiscuous girl. Miss Jackson is about this woman who would sleep around, not really caring who she hurt emotionally in the process by making them fall in love with her by before ditching them as the professionals would call it, a root and scoot. Brendan, apparently, was quite the promiscuous boy in his youth until that exact same thing happened to him and he realised how he felt and how bad that made someone feel. So he went through some character development and changed for the better because he never wanted to feel that way again, nor make anyone else feel that way. Now, Miss Jackson was actually based off of Janet Jackson, a, or rather the name Miss Jackson that he decided to go with, was actually based off Janet Jackson, a well-known hip-hop artist, well-known even by me, because I can do the Janet Jackson, a dance move. I would show you, but considering that this isn't a vi visual medium, I guess I can't. Oh no, I guess my identity will remain secret. Anyway, so Miss Jackson, I give a 7 out of 10. It has a sick intro, but the rest of the song is kind of a letdown. It sounds nice in general, but the intro proves that it could have been great. Instead, it'll just have to settle for good. Next up, Vegas Lights. We get some children counting to an interesting beat. Sax? It might be sax, I don't know. But it also sounds like Sesame Street, that intro. Uh, the... Re ref I write the refrain is a lot. I don't think the elements gel well. I think what I meant is like the instrumental is like a lot. There's a lot of electronics going on and then you have like another choir that's kind of doing like the like a kind of a melody type of thing going on, but they've got electric filters on their voice. It's an, it's a lot. And I don't actually think the elements gel that well. Uh, Brendan's singing with the filters, this time it just sounds weird. Like, I'm kind of imagining that, like, when you add a digital effect to your voice, the best that it's going to be is not really noticeable, or, like, you can ignore it because the rest of the song is good. Here it sounds weird. Like, the electronic voice doesn't sound as good as it has before. Maybe because a lot of the elements in this song I don't like as much as the others, so it's kind of harder to ignore. The rhythm in the chorus does sound nice. The verses are sh super short, actually, as is the chorus. It's, it went through very quickly. We then get a falsetto bridge, and when I say that I mean the bridge is sun in falsetto. Uh, the soft, almost weak falsetto clashes with the heavy electronic instrumentals. And again, I'm not sure if it's in a good way. The choir sounds rather grainy. I don't know. I'm not really a fan of it, honestly. The song was written as an idea to Sin City, discussing both its positive attributes and its negative ones. That much is obvious, because... Every piece of art showing Las Vegas shows the great enticing stuff, the big lights and the money, but also the horrible parts as well. Vegas is actually one of the few places where people are quite happy with it being a place with a lot of... with it being portrayed as a place with a lot of grey areas to it. Also, 
That Sesame Street thing I mentioned before is actually a legit sample, possibly a note, a nod, to Brendan's childhood growing up in Las Vegas. So I give Vegas Lights a 5.5 out of 10. I find the song rather monotone with a generally grating instrumental, but there's still a decent amount of stuff in it that I find quite nice to listen to as well. So next up, Girl That You Love. The intro reminds me of Hotline Miami, if you know that game. It, like, it really reminds me of the soundtrack to that game. If you haven't played it, then, well, play it. I like it. Anyway, Brendan's vocal effects in this song sound cooler, which kind of makes me think that maybe it's kind of a fine art to get in, like, that perfect happy medium when it comes to, you know, that stuff. When it comes to electric voice filters. We get some strong drums, like really strong. It's very electronic, the song overall is very electronic. Mm. Speaking like Yoda I am apparently. Anyway, it's very electronic. I like. I like a lot. The chorus sounds very much like the verses. Uh, it doesn't really change much in intensity. In fact, I think it gets a little less intense during the chorus. The vocals sound really good. Brendan's gotten really good with rhythm and punchy word combinations. It's He's definitely come a long way as far as lyricism goes, compared to, you know, uh, Phoebe You Can't Sweat Out, where it was all very wordy. Uh, the song has a very samey four chord progression. The bridge adds a bit of variety to the song. A little, but still, it's appreciated. Uh, another, s and Girl That You Love is actually another song that basically just ends as soon as the chorus is finished. Not saying that's a bad thing, it's just interesting to note. So, this song is about a guy, or girl, who knows, who is in love with a girl, but for one reason or another feels like they shouldn't, but they're trying to forego any of these potential reasons, no matter how valid they may be, in the name of love, because this person would do anything for love. So he's merely pretending to dislike the girl. Unless they actually see something they don't like that has stopped her from pursuing her more directly. This love ends up turning to the point of obsession, following the girl home, kinda creepy there buddy, while the girl believes that the narrator doesn't actually like her, ruining their chances with her. So in an interview, Brendan said that the song was originally supposed to be in French, actually. It was called Coeur de Guimauve. I'm just gonna... Just gonna, um... Check that that was... That is how you pronounce it, because, um... Honestly, uh... You know, some, sometimes... Sometimes it's hard to pick when it comes to French. Okay. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm muted. Okay. Coeur de Guimauve. Oh, dear. Okay. Coeur de Guimauve. That's, uh, okay, that's probably the closest I'm gonna get. So, yeah, that was originally the title, uh, which translates to Marshmallow Heart, but he thought a song in French would be too pretentious. So, he translated it back to English and titled it Girl That You Love, which kinda sorta rhymes with Curl de Guimauve. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It, so it sounds like it. It almost like slant rhymes it. So anyway, Girl That You Love, I give this a 6.5 out of 10. The techno sounds good, and I don't usually like techno that much, but here it sounds good. It sounds good. Structurally, the song is very samey, however, which is why it's not higher. So next up, we have Nicotine. Now, Nicotine starts off with chimes in the intro, which sounds very nice. Then we get the electric guitar, then drums. We get a very nice intro. It all stacks up before leading back to the beginning where it's just chimes. Uh, we get some really nice singing from Brendan, no vocal effects, sounds really good. 
Is this the first song that doesn't have any effects to his voice? I don't know. Who knows? Uh, we get some very strong language in the lyrics. Um, you know, not, not very family-friendly of Brendan, you know? Um, the pre-chorus is origin... Like, the pre-chorus starts off with just the bass... While Brendan is, like, r using some really powerful singing there. He's going very high, very hard. And then this leads... Then leading to the drums and, as I'd said before, very strong vocals from Brendan. And then we get to the chorus. That guitar is so hot. Like, it's sick. It really covers Brendan's vocals very nicely. The second verse includes more... Bass? Drums? I'm not actually sure. But there's more layers now. We also get double vocals, more layers. Is, like, I think Brendan's harmonising with himself? Or maybe he's just, like, singing the same note. Uh, twice. Regardless, more layers. Uh, the chorus is very explosive, and the lead-up is a really good lead-up. It's, like, a really good, like, build-up to the explosive chorus. It's great. The bridge then pulls everything back one more time with very soft vocals again. Still strong language, though. Uh, the beat then picks up, cuts out, and then comes back in full force for the third chorus. The song stops suddenly again. Like, that's how it ends. It just stops suddenly. I think at this point, This Is Gospel is the only one that had much of an outro. So, nicotine is clearly about a toxic relationship, being with someone who is apparently worse than nicotine. You know, the chemical in cigarettes. Brendan compares his love to this person as being like a drug, but most other songs like this portray that in a positive light, when it's like, oh, your love is a drug, or... I'm addicted to your love, or something like that. This is one of the only songs I know of that compares love to a drug and says that's a bad thing, which it probably would be in that context. Overall, I give Nicotine a 9 out of 10. It has a sick chorus, awesome sound throughout, great varied vocals, and best of all, lots of layers. Layers that stack. And you know us ogres, we love our layers. We love them. More than anything. So next up, we have Girls, Girls, Boys, or Girls Slash Girls Slash Boys. I think it's meant to be Girls, Girls, Boys. So, this is an anthem for the LGBT community. It has become an anthem for them. And I am a firm believer of LGBT. They definitely exist, so this is a song that exists. And who has a problem with that? Absolutely nobody. That's what I thought. So, with all of the uh, world is a wonderful, peaceful place out of the way, let's get into the actual song. We get some nice techno sounds. They sound very woo. Like, that. that's kind of what it sounds like the techno sounds are doing. They're like, woo, 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 woo. You know? So these lyrics seem a little relationship vulture-ish. Uh, I think it's like, the first lyric is like, I don't care, you've got a boyfriend, which sounds like a relationship vulture to me. It kind of sounds like, uh, that Shawn Mendes song, uh, Treat You Better, which is all about a relationship vulture. A guy who's just, like, prowling around a, uh, relationship just waiting for it to die so he can swoop in and be like, hey, heard you're in the market again. What exactly is this song about? Yeah, you know, like one of the lyrics is just give in. It's interesting. Uh, the chorus is nice. Not exactly great, I would say. Um, one of the lyrics is love is not a choice. No, it isn't. It is not a choice. Uh, you know, it, I, I was born this way. Yeah. Um, another lyric is I don't want to save your reputation, which raises a lot more question marks about what this is. The lyrics actually sound kind of similar. I mean, as uh, sinister. Then you get to the the bridge, where he says that he's a villain just vying for attention. At least the guy's honest about being a villain. 
Uh, the beat is catchy, but it never really changes up at all. So, this song explores bisexuality. Who'd have thunk it? It states the importance of holding a truthful sexual identity and celebrates the courage it takes to live publicly. The song's also inspired a lot of people and has made a significant impact on others' lives, which is very nice to hear. It's great that people love this song so much that it's been like an inspiration for them. Overall, I give Girls Girls Boys a 7 out of 10. It sounds funky, it's nice and funky, it doesn't really change at all throughout, though. The vocals are really the only variance to the song. Which, in this instance, wasn't really enough for it to be much higher than a 7. I appreciate the good that the song's done, though. It's done a lot of good. Which I can appreciate. And I am repeating myself a lot. To be continued slash concluded in the next episode. Until then, have a good one.